Here we are again with yet another episode of My Methods. I've had several requests for more information about steaking. And again, I believe uh, that steaking is from the root word to stake, to fasten something in a position. And the steaking is a heavy back stitch that occurs at the lower edge of the sewn portion of the pleats. And its purpose is to reinforce this lower edge and also to keep the tartan properly aligned so that we don't get that effect when you're looking at the kilt, so that we don't have a sort of a jagged sawtooth at the pat at the bottom. Now again, I'm doing this as a left-hander. If you're a right-hander, your options are learn to do it left-handed, or possibly turn it around and bring it close so that you'd be sewing in this direction, because we can't be sewing with the grain, of, with the lay of the pleats. We have to do it against the lay of the pleats. Now I'm not deliberately being mean to right-handers, but at the same time, welcome to the left-handers world. Coming up with your own methods in a world where everything's backwards to you, at least. So I'm gonna do this with white thread, just to show, so you can see the contrast, because if I was, normally I'd be doing this with black thread, of course, to be, as invisible as possible, but we're going to use a white thread and then I'll take it out and properly do it later. So my first stage is I lay the kilt out and I flip back all the pleats. And sometimes with a very with narrow pleats, you don't have enough material to do this and they keep flopping back in place. But I go through this and I, as I did bef before, I cut the thin the back out because I was looking for imperfections where it's, it, with every pleat, there's only two pieces of cloth being sewn together, the, the pleat and the piece next to it. We're not sewing through multiple layers at the same time. That may seem like a labor-saving or time-saving device, but it won't work. Uh, and, it'll, and the person who alters that kilt at any point in the future will be cursing a blue streak because you will have created exponentially more work for that person. So I've unfolded, or I folded back all of my pleats to the first one, and as you can see, how I'd marked the first pleat with chalk to make it absolutely sure that I wasn't going to cut out the fish as I'd done with the others. And I'd cut back the, the next three pleats, and that number isn't a fixed thing. I, had, I cut back as many pleats as necessary so that when we fold in the canvas, we can, we can fold this all the way back. Now, it, later on, this won't, we won't have that gap. There's gonna be a bit of an overlap, but that'll be the subject of a later video. So I bring it back to the very first pleat. Um, I look for my needle, which was suddenly hard to see. Now, when I'm doing this for real, this is gonna be waxed. It's gonna be black thread. I'm gonna have a thick knot at the end. So I stretch with this first one. I, I stretch it out a little bit because the things we want to avoid, we want to avoid a bump, a, a bell on this side because it was sewn too close together, as you can see here. We want to avoid any sort of extra cloth popping up like that. If it happens later on, our options are to pick it apart and do it again. That's the way we do it. Or alternately, by pressing it, you can shrink that. But that is a cheat. So we stretch it tight. So I've just made sure that that is flat. I make sure that the tartan is properly aligned. And there's my mark. So I make sure the element of the tartan is aligned. Now I fold this first pleat back and I do a back stitch, having cleverly run the needle into my finger. I do a back stitch, so that's gonna hold it tight. Pull it tight again, I bring it down, and I do a couple of back stitches there, and now I do a running back stitch. As neat as can be, nobody's ever gonna see this until they open the kilt up to do an alteration or a repair but we want the person who does that work, and it might be a good deal after you're dead, to go, oh, look at that, that's beautiful, as opposed to, oh, what butcher did this, right? So, so that's the first one down, and I've sewn it well past the edge of the next pleat, and again, this is where the, the, the um, design of the cloth works with us, because it gives us a reference point. So I might actually in future go fur further all the way to, that, to the black there for a reason I'll explain in a minute. So the next one, I spread it flat, and a back 
stitch and another stitch and now we're running back stitch again now maybe I could I could probably do those a little bit neater a little closer together and I should add that this first one went through all the layers of cloth this and the subsequent ones are only going through the upper layers uh, the upper layers of cloth on this side so when I flip this over we see where I started, but we don't see stitches along here, and we see that these are nice and flat. So, and then the next one, and again, I flatten it out nicely, and I stitch, and yeah, so we're not going through all the layers of cloth, but we're going through most of them. And this uh, seam upon seam upon seam, makes a heavier reinforced seam. And in, in early kilts that I've seen, other kilts that I've seen, the tailor, the kilt maker, often sees fit to use a really strong heavy thread or a number of uh, light threads rolled together to create sort of a cable. And I think, it's, I think it's overkill, quite frankly. So we keep doing like that. Now I'm gonna do a couple of bad ones just to show you what to avoid. We want to avoid and this will be funny because I'm not sure if I can actually do a bad one. Let's find out. Yep, I did a bad one. Um, I've, I've created, now see this is really good cloth and, and it's not really showing it, but I've taken the stitch too far over so that it's pulling the cloth this way. And um, I can't immediately recall what the consequences of that are, <coughs> but all I remember is being strictly admonished as a kid not to do it. Well, one thing we've got it now we've got extra cloth right here, which is going to create a lump when we put in the lining. Um, it's going to be uncomfortable and possibly because that's no, no no longer completely flat. We're going to get a bump on that side as we see here. So there's the one thing to avoid: crimping it in like that, or not pulling it flat and allowing that to to bell out. So there we go. I'm going to carry. I would carry on this this on all the way to the end. Now, when the thread runs short, because you're not going to simply can't have one piece of thread the entire length, is that I would sew well under the pleat, and then I'm just reaching for my scissors. Let's imagine that that was the end of the thread. I would then bring in a new piece of thread. I might knot it or I might just do a back stitch like this. Back <laughs> Let me do that again. That just pulled off the needle. A back stitch like that. And then tie these two off. So one, two, three. So that would be a knot. And then we lay the next pleat over it. And the knot's hidden. It's not. You can't really feel it. And then you carry on stitching. And I would do that all the way until I got to the end. When I got to the end, I've marked, like, there's my last seam. There's my seam between the inside apron and the, and the first pleat. There's my seam right there. So I moved over and I felt where the second seam is and I made a chalk mark because when I'm sewing a lot, the steaking, the steaking is gonna stop here at this second seam. We're not gonna carry on to the first seam. Because we carry on past the first seam, we've only got a couple of layers of cloth there, and it's going to be much more difficult to sew that without ha either having the steaking thread visible on this side or making it pucker, because even if we've done our best and we haven't completely penetrated this out layer of cloth, when we tighten it, we're going to get a pucker there, and that's going to be immediately visible. So we only sew as far as that second seam where I've marked, because you can feel it with your finger. And then I'll back stitch it a couple of times to anchor it, knot it, and tie off. And that, when properly done, all of the elements of the tartan are precisely lined with each other. And incidentally, that's a way you can tell at a glance when you're looking at a kilt. Let's say that the lining is there, and you're seeing this effect. You see where that's offset, and that's offset, and that's, off that's offset you know without opening the lining that they've done a poor job inside and they haven't steaked it properly. So you're going to have to pull it out and properly steak it and pull them back up into position. I think that just about covers steaking. Um, 
If you have any more questions, uh, please feel free to ask, and I'll do my best to answer them as quickly as I may. We're busy as all get out right now with our with our current work workload of new kilts, alterations, and our truce project. So it might be a little time before I get back to you, but I will reply. So thank you very much.